Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to this webinar from Jubilee Debt Campaign. We're just seeing all the attendees joining, so we'll start properly in a minute once um, everyone's been able to join. So hi everyone, my name is Tim Jones. I'm Head of Policy at um, Jubilee Debt Campaign. And tonight um, we're going to be joined by Chennai Mukumba, who is the Director of Cuts International in Zambia. Uh, hopefully Abdul Khaliq from CADTM in Pakistan. And Patricia Miranda, who's a Global Advocacy Director for Latin Dad, which is the Latin American Network for Economic and Social Justice. Uh, this is a webinar, so you can't see all the other participants, but if you want to introduce yourselves to everyone else, you can do so in the chat box. And so if you click on chat and you can um, type a quick message in there saying hi to everyone else. If you do that, you need to change the setting from to all panelists to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can um, see you. Otherwise, um, just a few of us will get to see your message. And also through the webinar, if you have any questions, if you open the Q&A box, and then write your questions in there and we will um, come on to them um, in a uh, bit. So we know that the world has been um, hit drastically by the coronavirus crisis of the um, last months through this year. Um, it's had a huge impact on health and it's also had a huge impact on uh, economics and um, people's well-being. Before the crisis even began, 64 countries around the world were spending more on debt payments than they were on healthcare. And the crisis has made that worse as countries have lost um, income from things that they sell. We've seen interest rates rise on debts that um, governments are paying. And we've also seen health needs um, drastically increase. So the Jubilee Debt Campaign and with the um, allies we're, um, who are joining with us tonight, we have been campaigning globally for a cancellation of debt payments in response to this crisis. And um, globally over 800,000 people have signed a petition calling for an immediate cancellation of debt payments. Uh, we've had over 250 organizations around the world have joined the campaign. What has happened so far is that back in April, there was a um, agreement amongst the G20 finance ministers. That's the group of self-appointed most um, powerful countries in the world. And they agreed to offer a suspension on debt payments. It was it's, um, quite limited. So it's, to understand debt, there are three different types of debt that governments tend to owe. Um, firstly is to other governments. Secondly is to international institutions like the World Bank. And thirdly is to private lenders such as banks and hedge funds. So what this um, G20 agreement said was that countries could um, stop paying their debts to other governments for the rest of this year, but those missed payments would need to then be paid in the future. Um, and they also called on um, multilateral, um, these international institutions and private creditors to do something similar. However, for the last two months, we've seen both of those groups um, lobbying and arguing against that. So as of the moment, um, 
what we have is that of the 73 countries that could get this debt suspension, about 40 are requesting it the, to stop their payments to other governments, um, but they're not um, getting any suspension to these other creditors and there has been hardly any debt cancelled so far there has been a bit to the IMF um, but that's um, quite small and just for a few um, countries uh, but that's just to serve as a general introduction to where we are but I now want to um, come to our um, speakers and um, Chennai, is it okay if I ask you to speak first? So Chennai is the director of Cuts International in Zambia and she can um, speak to us about the COVID crisis in Zambia, what is happening with the um, debt situation and um, what those of us internationally and in the UK can do to support um, people in Zambia at this time. Um, Chennai, over to you. Great, thanks so much, Tim. Um, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to be able to, to speak on this platform. Um, so with regards to the debt crisis, um, as an institution, we've been following this for a number of years now. Um, I'd say almost four, four or five years ago as civil society, we started to get really concerned um, by the level of escalating debt um, in Zambia. Um, and so started to have engagements both with the Ministry of Finance, um, the government here in Zambia, as well as the IMF, I think trying to understand what we needed to do to avoid um, getting to the situation we find ourselves in today. Um, and so really that serves as the, back, the background. Um, Zambia essentially now has an external debt We have a domestic uh, debt burden sitting at about 85 um, billion kwacha. And, and it's expected that is, this is going to be um, over 100% um, of our GDP. Um, and, and increasingly, what we're starting to see now as a result of this debt burden um, is a lot of redirecting of funding, of, of support um, for other key and crucial um, parts of the economy um, being sent to um, cover interest payments. Um, just last year, for example, 90% um, for example of our domestic revenues was spent on debt interest payments as well as salaries um, within the government, leaving just under 10% to be spent on all other sort of economic and social um, sectors of the economy. And so for us as civil society, of course, this was of concern and, you know, have, have been making a lot of um, efforts to try and um, engage both with the IMF and, and the government on the same. And so speaking to um, the pandemic, it, it literally, one would say, caught us um, in a position where we thought things couldn't get any worse. And, and now what we have seen um, is really just an exacerbation of the direction the economy was already going in. Um, because of the slowdown in terms of economic growth, we have seen this really have such a disaster um, type effect on, on Zambia. Um, so in terms of health burden, we really haven't been as negatively affected as many other countries around, across the world, um, but the socioeconomic implications have been devastating. So we've been seeing massive job losses, massive business closures, um, and all of this obviously having a ne negative effect on livelihoods. So um, in terms of what we're trying to do as civil society, I think many, many of the, I think participants may be aware that the Zambian government has now engaged a consultant to help them engage in sort of debt restructuring. Um, and as a result of this, we did see some positive response, I think, in, in, in the international market. Um, but this is a conversation I think many of us had been already trying to get the government to engage in. Um, because now what it means is that essentially we are headed in a, in, in a debt default direction and so we need to do all we can to avoid that. Um, in terms of solutions, um, we, we are calling for increased transparency. Um, in terms of the way we see allies such as yourself supporting, um, like you rightly indicated, there's a significant amount of debt currently um, that lies with private creditors. Um, and so 
conversations such as what's going on with the G20, for example, in Zambia wouldn't have a significant positive effect on our debt burden because it really only contributes to about 20, 30%. A significant amount of our debt is actually with private creditors. Um, and so essentially what we would really, I think, be looking to see is support um, on, on some of the already ongoing conversations with regards to the way in which the private, private creditors um, could provide some sort of leniency um, you know, within the debt conversations. Um, and so I think in a nutshell, this is, this is where we are. I think um, our, our, our current debt situation is really having such a negative effect. And we did, a, we did a survey just last year where we were trying to understand what the average person thinks about debt. And it's concerning that, you know, even conversations that normally, you know, are, are sort of left to sort of economists are now sort of conversations that happen around the dinner table because people are starting to see the implications of this debt burden on their lives. And so definitely a conversation that we are pushing as civil society and, and keen to see the way in which different actors from around the world can help support um, us in trying to navigate this space. Brilliant, thank you for that very um, excellent summary. Um, if we move on now to, um, uh, we'll come back for questions to everyone. I know that um, what you said has already prompted some questions, but if we now hear from Abdul Khaik, who is from CADTM in Pakistan, to fill us in on how the situation looks in Pakistan and what the government has been doing there. Yes, thank you, Tim. Can you hear me? Hi, yes, Tim. Yes, perfectly. Yeah, okay, thank you. you. Uh, first of all, sorry for being uh, late a couple of minutes. Uh, there was some problem with my internet. So I joined, I think I'm late two, three minutes with the start of the... So uh, thank you very much. Uh, and Chennai has... Uh, yeah, it's very interesting. Let me tell you about uh, the Pakistan, but I would like to start from with the, with the situation of Corona in Pakistan. Uh, in the last week, Pakistan has been, uh, has been described as the top 10 countries. Corona is, uh, you know, cases of Corona are increasing very high speed. It is almost uh, 108, uh, 1,008, uh, almost 1 lakh and 8,000 people have been tested positive and uh, almost daily positive cases that are, uh, which is being reported are around 5,000, while 2,200 deaths have been reported so far. Anyway, but this, uh, the government is in catch 22 in Pakistan, whether it go for the strict lockdown at the cost of the working classes who are actually millions and millions of people who are actually daily wages and uh, government is really worried about uh, about the uh, their uh, you know jobs opportunities and uh, it is uh, the, and the people are in fact not uh, very much serious to observe the lockdown even government is uh, issuing daily uh, sops to observe that but it is very difficult for the government perhaps it lacks will now that is why the cases have been uh, rising uh, at, a, at a very high speed. Uh, in South Asia, if we uh, discuss the Pakistan is the second highest country after India. So this is the situation uh, about Corona and uh, well with the start of this Corona, Pakistan's uh, economy was already in shambles, let me tell you. That uh, right now Pakistan's debts are increased by uh, almost in the last one year, more than $20 billion. And the debt to GDP ratio has been uh, is touching to 90% uh, of the GDP. And uh, there is uh, remittances have been almost dried. Estimates are saying that uh, uh, our, uh, our urban economy has been shrink uh, from 30 to 40% almost. And uh, the, uh, the government has been being forced for, uh, to go for privatization, in fact. Yes, G20, uh, the government welcomed the G20 decision and uh, 
Pakistan got some relief, but it is, I think it is just a drop in the ocean as uh, the total, uh, you know, uh, debt relief counts, uh, it is $1.8 billion. And it is for just for eight months. Too small for too short time, in fact. So, uh, but instead of that, the multilaterals, IMF and World Bank, the, the, uh, despite the appeal of the Prime Minister Imran Khan, they didn't give any relief. Rather, they extended further debts. Pakistan last month contracted uh, another contract with IMF, $1.4 billion as an emergency fund to combat the corona. Same is the case with the uh, uh, World Bank and Asian Development Bank is constantly extended loans to Pakistan. Uh, and among this, uh, uh, I, uh, I guess many of the participants and panelists also knew about Pakistan, perhaps the first country, which uh, launched the appeal for a debt relief to, the, to Pakistan and other developing countries. And uh, as a result, uh, G20 gave this uh, relief to 76 countries, more or less, uh, you know, every country took some benefit out of it. That's good, but not enough. It must go beyond. Because in, the, in this situation, uh, the picture is very horrible for Pakistan. Look, till 2023, I mean, in next 23 months, Pakistan have to pay uh, $27.8 billion, which means that $1 billion a month as repayment of loans and interest over $1 billion every month. So in a situation when Pakistan economy is, all, is a kind of on ventilator itself, its uh, growth rate has been projected as a minus 1.5% for this year and next year. So 18.6 million jobs has been lost. Remittances has been dried. Revenue is shrinked. There is no foreign investment at all. So in this situation, Pakistan's economy, it is beyond doubt to say that uh, it is next to impossible that economy can survive without constant inflow of loans, constant inflow of you know, uh, injection of uh, for investment, foreign, uh, you know, funding. But the point is that uh, why in this crisis, it's this unparalleled, you know, amount of crisis in this, the international institutions, financial institutions, especially, they are not uh, realizing the situation and constantly uh, extending loans in, in, uh, instead of grants. As far as civil society is concerned, we in Pakistan as a CDTM and other uh, social justice campaigners and like that have been uh, uh, demanding to the, to the government of Pakistan as well as to the international creditors, including bilateral, multilateral, as well as private creditors, that uh, this is not the time to extend loans. If they can do something for countries like Pakistan and other developing countries, that is the grants they can do it. So, but uh, I think they, it's, uh, you know, the situation is uh, very, very disappointment for us as a civil society. So, uh, what we have been uh, demanding to the international institutions as a debt just campaigner for Pakistan, that they should, they should keep moratorium, extend this moratorium, not for eight months, but for 2023, at least for two years. Nothing less than this period can work. And this moratorium not be on only on bilateral loans, but also on multilateral loans as well as private loans, because Pakistan has a huge amount of private uh, loans as well. So. Let me tell you that in uh, next 23 months, Pakistan will, will be paying $27.8 billion. And the biggest amount, the $19 billion, will be going to IMF, World Bank, ADB, and China. Pakistan in its negotiation with China to some extent. It's a CPEC loans and all that. But uh, uh, we, we also 
uh, you know, expect from the other multilateral donors that they must think about it and uh, cancel not only Pakistan, but other developing countries' debt. So uh, in this situation, our clear demand is to the, to the creditor is that uh, there should be extend a moratorium on all payments, including bilateral, multilateral, and private, till 23rd, for at least two years. Secondly, there must be no further loans, only grants. And thirdly, uh, we think that uh, the pressure on government of Pakistan for privatization, the recently, uh, the, one of the strict conditions by the IMF, even under this emergency loan, uh, they are pushing the government, they are pushing the government to the wall to go for the privatization of its steel mills, of its airports, of its national airline, and so big social inter, uh, state enterprises, which means to create more and more unemployment. So which is really uh, a bad omen for the, for the, uh, for the Pakistani uh, government and Pakistani people, I think. So we are not making demands to the international creditors only, but we are also uh, making demands to our own government that they should stop taking for the loans and what they should do in this situation in this precarious situation is that they should announce a unilateral moratorium on all the debts and it is possible but we know that the constant intimidation from the from some creditors like credit agencies they are blackmailing pakistan to announce it as a, as a bad uh, credit rating if it goes further for the you know any uh, any any radical taking radical position so i also wanted to share with you that uh, government of pakistan took lead to raise this issue of debt relief at the un level as well there was an informal meeting of uh, more than team is this issue that uh, the debt relief is not enough. They must go some beyond this uh, situation. So I think the, the, the remedy for Pakistan in this situation is that uh, only there should be a, if creditors uh, put a moratorium, extend moratorium this for the last next two years, good enough. And if they do not, government itself should announce unilateral moratorium for, for at least next two two years and at the same time the government should also establish a debt audit commission to 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 uh, to dig out to identify the the patterns of uh, loaning in the last so many years under new liberal offensive all this is very much important to know that uh, what kind of loans this uh, Either uh, there might be some part of uh, OGOs or illegitimate loans, it must be addressed in the perspective of the international human rights. And we also demanding that the UNCTAD, United Nations uh, Conference on Trade and Development's proposal has some weight. This proposal must be given consideration uh, by the creditors to look into it, uh, how can it be worked out. A permanent uh, debt solution mechanism is also now, I think uh, it is uh, now very much uh, pertinent at this time to discuss this issue at the International Forum because uh, we think that uh, now it is, uh, it is enough is enough because to our understanding, Pakistan, uh, if, if it is not uh, a stock stick, loans there is no way it cannot go ahead even an inch without foreign inflow of funds so default may be imminent at any time it is hard it is so before it is too late 
the creditors and the international civil society, we request them uh, like in UK and others to raise this and amplify this voice that before going any and any such incident of uh, uh, default or uh, you know bankruptcy, they should take seriously this issue into account because uh, there is no chance then uh, I think and uh, default, if it is not good for Pakistan, it is not good for the creditors as well. This is the no, I think. That is why they, they are constantly pumping in and injecting new loans, but not the grants. So uh, let me finish with this, that uh, the international civil society and we also need a global a global movement of civil society with with the with a global agenda maybe some other issues included in this there is an issue of feminism climate and other issues there are very pertinent issues definitely but debt justice on the top of this agenda let's have a broad based international uh, so, social movement this is the this is the time for us as a civil society to launch this thank you very much brilliant thank you um, abdul and i'll um I'm jumping straight off from um where you just finished there on the questions um Chennai there was a um question for you is why is debt default to be avoided, and what would be the repercussions? Um, and maybe related to that um, on your presentation, uh, have the vulture funds been circling around Zambia's debt already? So I wondered what your um, perspectives are on defaults um, and responding to those questions. Great, thanks. Thanks so much for that, Tim. Um, I think, I think um, there is a lot of um, I think weary sentiment around around debt default um, in Zambia. In fact, I think there there are already certain uh, thoughts that you know we have already to some extent um, defaulted. Um, for example, when it comes to certain domestic um, debt that exists, um, the, the the biggest fear I think locally here with regards to debt default um, is that essentially it then leaves uh, Zambia's assets open. Um, you know, to, to, to potential um, loss. And I think we've seen that happening in other countries. And so I think, I think many um, stakeholders are concerned um, of that particular implication um, in terms of sovereignty um, being jeopardized. Um, I, I think, I think the, the issue, however, of, of debt restructuring, as I mentioned earlier, is something that has been at the forefront of, of many, many different stakeholders for a number of years. And so I think essentially, um, a lot of people initially, when we essentially got this consultant on board, um, you know, were concerned about the fact that we had initially got them on board. But I think the thinking is that at least we, we look like we're headed in the right direction, we're having the right types of, of, of conversations um, in terms of how we're essentially trying to ensure that we don't um, default. I think if, if we end up doing that, I think there's a lot of concerns around loss um, of different assets. Um, uh, Tim, I think you're muted in case you're saying. <laughs> yeah, sorry for being um, rubbish, everyone. That's very embarrassing. After um, three months of doing this, I'm still managing to speak when I'm on mute. Um, so the question is um, um, for both Chennai and Abdul um, Do you know who any of these private creditors are? And also, if you have um, more information on what the proportion of debt is that is owed to other governments and private creditors and um, international institutions. So, um, Chennai, do you want to go first? But then, Abdul, if you just follow on as well. Yeah, uh, so I think right now, when you take a look at, at, at Zambia's debt profile, um, so we have three euro bonds, I think, that are essentially due quite soon. 
Um, we have one that's due in 2022 for about 750 million. And then we have one a couple years later for 1.5 billion, and then one a couple years later for 1.75. Um, and so that, that um, constitutes a, a significant amount um, of Zambia's debt. And I think the reason why um, there's so much concern, um, because ultimately, like I mentioned right at the beginning, it's, it's difficult to negotiate, right? Um, this is very different from bilateral type um, debt, which is why I think the G20 conversations that are taking place are welcome, but at the end of the day, um, I think now, Tim, in response to your question, um, that really only constitutes about 20 to 30 percent of our debt. Um, the majority of Zambia's debt um, is essentially owed to, to private creditors, to private lenders. Um, and so there is a fear as well that even if, for example, we were to get some debt relief um, on the part of G20, what we would see is a redirecting of money that we would have paid to them, really being paid to, to private lenders, um, kind of doing away with that. Um, and so I think, as I mentioned earlier, the, the need to really push uh, private sector to come on board, um, because ultimately I think that the reason for, you know, these debt um, sort of cancellation suspension conversations are so that we can redirect resources to where it needs to go, particularly at this difficult time. Um, but I think up until then, um, because of the structure of our debt, um, that that type of relief wouldn't have, wouldn't provide as much reprieve um, as we would need. And Abdul, on um, who the creditors are? Yes, the, the creditors are, yes, uh, uh, the international financial institutions, bilateral and private creditors, yes, there is. Pakistan launched uh, Eurobonds in 2013, and the amount is more than $6 billion. And uh, similarly, some scoop bonds and other. So a total amount is around 10 this private credit, more than this. And uh, what, what, unfortunately, the government of Pakistan has decided not to seek debt relief from private creditors. This is their announced policy. And we have been raising this voice that look at African countries. They, they, the more African countries are focusing on the private creditors. They are, they are uh, focusing on them to give them debt relief as well. But in case of Pakistan, the, the, our finance minister and our governor of state bank, they are the, in fact, they are, they are the IMF's people there and uh, they are advising the prime minister that no, don't go for the, the private debt. Uh, uh, that is why the Prime Minister Imran Khan has made the appeal to the international community. Uh, that appeal was only to the bilateral debt and uh, international financial institutions. The private, private creditors were not included in that. And that is sad. I think that is sad because private creditors must be asked to join the, this uh, relief. Though difficult, but not impossible. I think if African countries are, uh, are uh, you know, working on it and giving, uh, you know, uh, some pressure on the, these private creditors, so Pakistan should do as well. So, but unfortunately, the government uh, has decided that uh, it is not their policy. But yes, they will keep on uh, asking debt relief from G20 or uh, for that matter for the international financial institutions but the problem on the part sorry you're just i'm um, breaking up on us at the moment abdul uh, skin Sorry, you were just breaking up um, on us at the moment. And um, Patricia from um, Latin Dad has just joined us. So um, I'll just move on to bring Patricia into the conversation. I just wanted to add one thing, which I was going to say a bit later, but it follows on from what both Chennai and Abdul have just been saying. With, um, for those of us in the UK, with these private debts, um, they are 
um, owed under a um, particular legal system, which means that if a country stops paying, the creditors can then sue that country and try and seize assets, as Chennai was saying. And generally, these debts are owed under either New York law or under English law which is for various historical reasons and colonialism and where creditors think they can um, seize assets from. And actually for many of the countries covered by the G20 agreement, and that includes both Zambia and Pakistan, the debts are owed under English law. So if a government does stop paying, it could then be sued in the High Court in London. And so for us in the UK, we have a particular responsibility because we can potentially try and get the law changed here to make it easier for governments to restructure debts rather than um, risk um, more of their assets being seized. Uh, but now I want to bring in Pathuthia Miranda, who is the Global Advocacy Director for Latindad, which is the Latin American Network for Economic and Social Justice. So Pathuthia, I assume you're in Bolivia now at the moment but um, you can fill us in on the situation there but also across um, Latin America more generally uh, so thank you for joining us. Thank you very much Tim for this invitation I'm very glad to be part of this panel and this uh, webinar. Well I would like to share uh, our analysis on the situation of Latin America um, all Latin American countries, except for Haiti and some Caribbean countries, have already a fiscal deficit before COVID-19. Uh, Argentina, Bolivia, the country uh, that I am based uh, now, uh, Brazil, Costa Rica, Ecuador, had the major deficit in 2019, but other countries had deficits for more than two years. The several commodity prices fall since 2014 and a high debt service projected for some countries to be paid in the next years are also issues that increase the already lack of fiscal space that our countries had to fight the pandemic impacts and to allocate, to have the capacity to allocate the resources to health and social protection needs with the urgency that the pandemic demands. The access to liquidity resources, uh, to liquidity to resources is urgent for our countries. And uh, unfortunately, the current options that our countries have is to get new loans, new credits, new debt, with few concessional lending uh, options since almost all Latin American countries are middle income countries. But we also need to consider that within that classification, uh, we have as well a lower middle income countries. And the difference between those countries and lower middle, lower, middle, lower income countries, the, the line between both is very thin. And this, this should be also taken into account. In almost all cases uh, in, in our countries, we have a, a precarious health systems and a, a high informal sector. It's uh, around, it's more than 50% of the economy. So the, the impact of the pandemic, the impact of the lockdowns are uh, hitting very hard to, uh, to workers, uh, to women, and in general to all population because of the lack of access to a health system. In addition, uh, the debt service in Latin America um, in several countries has been increasing in, in the last years. In some cases is even higher. It started to be higher than uh, social protection investment. So the concern is that uh, new credits and new loans will uh, mean will imply an, a new uh, a new heavy um, charge on our backs on our country's backs. Um, the composition of our debt is is diverse. Uh, we have uh, external credits with traditional creditors, 
We have uh, also a private debt with, uh, through sovereign bonds that have been issue, issued a lot in the last years from several countries. Even former hippie countries now issue sovereign bonds. And of course, it's among the highest, um, the, the highest interests in, uh, within the options of, of debt for our countries. We also have a domestic debt with pension funds and, and local banks. Uh, some of them are, are over the, the uh, average, such Argentina, Brazil, Costa Rica, El Salvador, and Venezuela. So uh, the, the solutions, the current solutions that the global community, as uh, I think uh, were somehow mentioned uh, before, like uh, the, the G20 and the IMF, and at regional levels also uh, regional banks, the main solutions that our countries have is in the form of new debt, which in our view, it's not really a solution. It, it is a post postponement of the problem because there are not uh, the conditions in place, uh, nor in the short term, nor in the long term for our countries to, to um, guarantee that they will be able to repay that debt. What's more, that will increase the burden, the debt burdens, as I was saying before, and they will undermine a debt sustainability, so the risks will be higher. And afterwards, it will lead to our countries to decide to prioritize between paying the debt service or over social and health spending. The, the recovery for our countries uh, will be much longer and and more painful. Uh, our countries are being seriously hit, not only by, by the pandemic, but also it's a multiple crisis that has been deployed after uh, COVID. Um, there will be a global recession. In, in the case of Latin America, the IMF itself said that it will be another lost decade for the region. So the recovery will be really longer uh, there are project projections from ECLAC that poverty and inequality will increase uh, after, the, after the pandemic. So the current solutions are, are not uh, really ambitious to take forward the, the challenges, the current challenges of this uh, multiple crisis. Um, in our view, it's important to take short-term measures and long, middle and long-term. Among the short-term, it's important to free up resources. And for that, and jointly with you and other uh, debt movements and organizations, we are um, demanding the immediate and permanent debt service cancellation, not only for 2020, but also for 2021 and from all creditors. Each creditor has its, its challenge on this, but from where uh, the current status of this type of initiatives only, uh, uh, it's, it's only bilateral creditors in the case of the G20 or only for uh, the lowest uh, income countries in the case of the IMF, but uh, the the impact of the crisis and the recession will also hit very hard to middle income countries that are not part of any of these initiatives and to have a debt, um, to have the, can, the debt, uh, debt service cancellation will be, would be really important in the short term. But as well, uh, thinking longer, this wouldn't be enough. Uh, our countries would need access to more resources uh, and not in the form of debt, in the form of grants. So some of the uh, demands from the region as well and from middle income countries is uh, the uh, issuance of the special drawing rights and their, uh, and their special conditions like no conditionalities involved because it doesn't need uh, an IMF program. Uh, what happened in 2009 in, in the global financial crisis uh, is an, an experience of how can this work with a low interest rate of 0.05%, no capital repayment, and 
uh, at that time and now it can be used for public budget and not only for a balance of payments. Uh, and part of this proposal is to uh, have a reallocation of, of SDRs, um, which uh, from, from developed countries that don't need these resources, who could give up to, we can say who could give up to these rights and transfer them to developing countries. And in the longer term, and as, as I very uh, fast mentioned at the beginning, uh, our countries have already, uh, some of our countries were close to a debt distress, some of them as Argentina already in technical default. So all these measures are basically to face the current crisis, but before COVID, the monster of debt was already there and this wouldn't be it wouldn't be solved. So in a, in a long-term view, it's still very important to have a debt restructuring process, which is um, fair and independent, and that uh, would, would, and under this context is more, um, is more easy to realize how important it is uh, that civil society also, we need to work more on what has, I think it was been, it, it has been mentioned before about what to do with private creditors, with private debt, uh, that it's less likely that we, we, we could have any uh, debt restructuring with them. In some cases from our, from our countries, we don't even know who they are, who are the, the invest, who are the investors that uh, all these uh, sovereign bonds, but it's it's crucial to address that. Our emblematic case in Latin America is still, unfortunately, Argentina, and it's a, a huge example of, on 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 their situation. And whatever uh, advances that Argentina could have in their debt restructuring process will be an important precedent for um, not only uh, other countries in the region, but also for the world. So I would leave it here, a team, and would be glad to take uh, questions or, or comments. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Patricia. Um, so do we still have 10 minutes left, so do keep firing your questions in. I mean, we do already have more questions than we can answer, but if we see some really good ones, we'll still um, try and throw them out there. Um, before I come back to you, Patricia, um, come, Chennai, um, I, I've got a question that what safeguards are needed to ensure that any debt relief um, meets the uh, needs of the general population? I wondered if you had any thoughts on that question. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, 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 think, I, I, I think we, We've been, we've been really pushing for increased transparency um, at the moment. I think there's a lot of money that's, that's coming into the country, um, many, much of which you know, a number of civil societies are starting to ask, um, you know, where is it going? Is it being spent in the right way, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think for us, there's a push for increased transparency um, locally, um, but also we're hoping that even from external, um, there's pressure as well, um, that those who are providing funding um, can also have those that are providing the lending be, be open about how much they're giving and where it's supposed to be going. Um, and so that's short term funding that we're getting right now for, for sort of COVID related issues. But I think there's, there's a broader conversation as well um, that we've been um, pushing a civil society in Zambia. And I think this sort of picks up from, um, I think a question that was asked earlier, um, somebody made reference to what, what, went, what happened in Mozambique, um, sort of debt that was contracted but wasn't done so legally. So in fact, there's a case um, right now um, in court um, because in our constitution, it, it indicates that debt should um, have national assembly approval, um, but that hasn't been happening. Um, and the argument is that we don't have the subsidiary legislation. And so because we haven't had national assembly approval, we haven't had our parliamentarians um, giving approval to this, this has obviously resulted, I think, in, in debt being um, contracted in a way that wasn't necessarily transparent or open, um, which, which has uh, many people asking, you know, this debt that we did contract, where did it go? Um, how much did we, how much we're getting back from it? Who has it benefited? And so long term, we're looking at sort of legislative um, issues that need to be addressed. But I think in the short term, it's a lot of call around transparency and accountability. 
Thank you. And for anyone who's been um, campaigning with Jubilee Debt Campaign, you'll know that we've been pushing for lots of um, rules to try and make lenders be transparent after various scandals in recent years where um, British um, banks and lenders have given money in secret, which has then um, not been um, well used. Um, uh, Abdul and Patricia, I've got a couple of questions around um, what role can members of parliament pay, play? Are they raising their voices as well as governments? And then is there cooperation between countries in the same region of the world to demand debt relief jointly? So um, Abdul first and then Patricia, if you've got more to add on the role that um, other parliamentarians can play and how governments um, are or could work together um, to advance these demands. Thank you, uh, Oh. Okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry, Abdul, you Kim, go first um, um, quickly and then okay, um, if you can leave okay. time for Patricia as well. Yeah, uh, first of all, I, 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 I agree with, uh, with my friend from uh, with Chennai, in fact. He says the question of transparency is very important. Yes, but on the part of the, not on the lender, as you said, it, it must be, it is very important on the part of the creditor. And the principle of joint responsibility must uh, take this ground, I think. Because uh, as Chennai said, uh, we too have in Pakistan a law. This is called the Fiscal Responsibility and Debt Limitation Act. According to it, that uh, there's, uh, the debt to GDP ratio should not cross the 60%. But right now, our Pakistan debt to GDP ratio is 90%. So it was, this law was formed in 2005. And since then, after 15 years, it is constantly violated. Uh, the debt to GDP ratio has never been 60%. It is 70%, 80%, now it is 90%. So question of transparency is really very important. And I think this, uh, this uh, question of trans, uh, transparency is, uh, you know, incomplete without, without uh, looking into the, into the option for uh, debt order commissions, the parliamentary debt order commissions, in fact. The parliament, the people's representatives must uh, look at it. So in our case, uh, the law says that uh, any contract, any, any loan uh, beyond $500 million must be debated in the parliament, must be approved by the cabinet, but it rare happens. Only finance minister is responsible for that. And it is rare that he, he tells the details of the you know, conditionalities and other things uh, shared with other colleagues and the parliament. So this is very unfortunate and uh, I really, it is a new thing for me that it is perhaps global in other countries in Zambia as well that uh, they are constantly violating these rules, kind of rules. As far as other parliamentarians are issues, in case of Pakistan, uh, in fact, the, uh, the opposition is, uh, is not opposing this uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan's proposal for debt relief. And, uh, but they are, uh, you know, opposing its style or like this, but uh, they are not vocal about it. Uh, anyhow, they are uh, vocal about that uh, government should not take further loans because Pakistan is already heavily burdened under loans. So this type of uh, voices are uh, there in the parliament from different political entities inside the parliament and outside the parliament really political forces and all the people are really worried about the mounting debt. And uh, that is why civil society is also very much concerned about it, that uh, the speed with which this uh, Pakistan's debt is mounting, it is unstable. It, is, uh, it, may, it may collapse any time because it is, uh, particularly after the COVID, the situation has further were strengthened as with regard to Pakistan's inability to repay these loans. So I think uh, uh, if you have any other questions, uh, I think I have answered. 
Thank you. And Patricia, um, on whether governments are working together or could do more together um, to demand um, debt relief. Have you got any perspectives on that? Well, I, I have to say that it's uh, not much coordinated work on this in Latin America. Uh, speaking of, of parliamentarians' role, um, uh, the uh, Parliament of Ecuador has requested the government not to, to pay uh, a, a debt, that, uh, that service on a specific credit they have uh, around uh, a month ago. But uh, this didn't happen, and the, the government of Ecuador uh, anyway paid this debt, which was just a very high amount, uh, just in, in the middle of the pandemic crisis. Uh, so it's, uh, I think we still have in the region that huge challenge um, from civil society organizations to work more and push more uh, to our governments and also from from our government side and and parliamentarians who are the ones that approve uh, laws and currently they are approving to take new loans to face pandemic so there is uh, a, an, an important a key role as well there and unfortunately we are taking uh, the, the new loans as the, the main and unique option to face the crisis now uh, in, in Latin America. Thank you. Um, we're almost out of time. We had a question of um, what are the best next steps for those of us in the UK to try and get those laws changed and um, when I was talking about the debts owed under English law and is there a particular focus date to get behind so in globally we um, have the next key moments are that in July um, the 18th to 19th the G20 finance ministers will be meeting again and then in October, they will be meeting and the IMF and World Bank have their annual meetings. And so those are the moments where we're expecting those powerful countries to be making decisions and where we can um, try and press for more change and for things to go further. In the UK, Jubilee Debt Campaign and with uh, many of the allies that we're working with, we're going to be asking people to be um, contacting your MPs over the next few weeks in the build up to the G20 um, meetings. So it would be brilliant if you could um, get on board um, with those, um, put pressure on um, our MPs and try and get um, those laws changed in the UK is one of the ways that we can have, have influence here. But also the UK does have disproportionate influence globally compared to its size. It is part of the G20 and in institutions like the World Bank, it has a very large say. In the World Bank, it has 7% of the votes, which is the third highest of any country, even though the UK has less than 1% of the world's population. So that is um, both an injustice um, um, that we, um, um, for many of us, have been calling for change for a long time to get more voice for other countries, but also that is um, a way that we can try and pressure them for change if that's the situation. So thank you so much for everyone for joining um, the webinar tonight and thank you so much Chennai and Abdul and Patricia for taking time out, some of you at very odd times of the day and um, I'm sorry we didn't get through any all the questions. Um, if you do have specific questions you really want to know the answer to, do follow up with us um, at Jubilee Debt Campaign. Make sure you're on our mailing list and we'll stay in touch with all the um, campaigning that is to come. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, Tim, and thank you, JD, all the panelists. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.